Our next speaker today is Dr. Joanne Hackett, and Joanne is a Senior Director for Genomics Partnerships and Alliances at IQVIA. And IQVIA is focused on using data and science to help their healthcare clients find better solutions for their patients. Joanne, I will now hand over to you for your presentation. Great, thank you. I'm just trying to upload those slides. Can you see them now? Yes. Ah, oh, perfect, okay. Excellent. Great. Thank you very much. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here today uh, with you. Um, I'm going to um, unfortunately not very well build on the last presentation in the sense that I would love to give a, a whirlwind tour of all the exciting um, things of a data driven healthcare system, but I'm going to focus a bit more on patient centricity and the promise of data as a whole. I think one of the things that was highlighted in the last presentation is that there are obviously very obvious regional differences when you think about data-driven healthcare systems. In addition to that, it's also very different the way patients uh, and citizens as a whole view data. Um, we saw some examples in the last presentation to show how mobile phones have been tracked and things like that. Some patients think that's fantastic because it would be a better way to be able to inform care decisions for them personally. And other individuals are actually quite afraid of that. So one of the things that's quite important when we think about patient centricity and the, the real need to understand data and what that looks like for personal care is actually it's a combination of is the individual well or sick? There's a real difference between individuals who are sick and well when it comes to uh, data-driven healthcare systems and their personal input. And in addition to that, it's really their maturity around how they feel about these sorts of systems. But, but generally speaking, there tend to be two real themes when we think about patient centricity as a whole. It's really what the patients are wanting, what healthcare providers want, what payers and systems expect, and really where the pharma industry is understanding things as well. So while there are the themes of, you know, the promise of data, there are also these different perspectives that must be taken into consideration. And again, there are regional differences for all of these different um, either healthcare providers or pharma, depending on regulatory environments and various things like that. So there, there's quite a lot of things to, to actually decipher. And I'm just going to whiz through a few slides today uh, to give you some perspective as to the way we deal with this. So when we think about all the healthcare data that we actually acquire, um, a lot of us think that our GPs or the healthcare system knows a lot about us. Uh, and while that's true uh, to, to some respects, there's actually quite a lot of data that's generated outside of your traditional healthcare environment. So how do we get better about um, gathering this, putting it all together and generating those insights that's so important to actually provide that personalized healthcare perspective? We saw in the last presentation, again, you know, many examples of how data can be collected, how can we empower the citizen to actually take an active role in that as well? Most of the data that we actually think about today that is part of our overall comprehensive healthcare package doesn't actually the healthcare, in the traditional healthcare system, I should say. So what are these tools and what are the ways that we can actually embed these into routine daily care? But also, how do we bring that patient with us on this journey? It's such an important thing to remember that each individual has a different data maturity index, if you want to call it that, and also an awareness. So there's really just four key things that I'm going to uh, talk about today. The enrichment of data, the connectivity of data, linkage of different data sources, and then the aggregation of all of this together. So when we think about the distinction between secondary and primary data research, a lot of times we think about the fact that we really should be in there embedding a lot of great uh, practices between the two of them. And should we really care about actually being the conduit to pull these things together? And the answer is obviously yes. And the answer is yes, because there is so much that can be collected from these different healthcare uh, systems, whether it's primary care or secondary care, and placing that individual at the heart of it and being able to pull through uh, this amount of data really does help with enriched studies. So extracting that data from the different source, linking it together at the patient level, using these
these unique identifiers um, and combining it into a comprehensive data set is absolutely key for us to be able to start to identify ways that we can aggregate things, ways that we can uh, look at for different insights and make smarter decisions. You saw the example in the previous slide, in, in the previous speaker's talk about the, the ways that pathologies, pathologists are doing different, um, different ways of being able to look at data on computers. This is the, exactly what we need to be doing by linking primary and secondary data to really enrich these studies. And then when we think of the connectivity, we think about these connected health technologies and how they're going to really and truly enable better clinical research. And of course they will, but I always say that we often forget that putting these things together is no simple feat and no one really gets excited about the plumbing, if you want to call it that. Really putting these different systems together, building very strong governance mechanisms, it sounds super boring to most people. That doesn't make it on the front page of a newspaper, but that's actually where we need to start to put a lot more investment because it's actually putting this together that is where all the to again help us to understand and to look at insights. If we really do connect all of these different sources together, again, you know, in the, in the last talk, we saw many different examples of how we can actually optimize clinical research, smaller study sizes, faster timelines. This is exactly what we need to be doing to really and truly enrich the whole experience of the individual, but also to take into consideration that things are different in different so you, we may be doing something very different in Hungary, or we may be doing something very different in France, but how do we actually maximize that for the individual that is actually part of this package? And then I think the other thing that we really need to think about is this connectivity piece allows us to think about the novel endpoints. Rather than thinking about your traditional clinical trial, are there ways that we can actually start to link this data together to allow us to see digital biomarkers, for example? And of course the answer is yes. So that connectivity piece is so important and it's so important to engage the patient in part of this as well, because as we said in the last slide, a lot of this healthcare data can actually be uh, aggregated outside of the traditional healthcare clinic. And so this is just a snapshot of some of the different uh, connect connected devices that actually one can either purchase themselves or find in healthcare systems. Now, if we think about these, are all of them in English? Should they be in English? Can they be actually in a different language? This is all important when you think about regional differences across the globe. And if there is something that's quite insightful, for example, in, in pain, are we going to be able to replicate that in other parts of the world? A lot of the natural language processing tools and techniques are actually built upon an, an English infrastructure. That's not super helpful if you actually try to implement it into a country where English is not the first language. So there are aspects of this that we really need to think about. The connectivity piece is a huge one. However, the patient perspective and all of that has to be one that actually works into the healthcare system as well. And then also with the linkage aspect of it. So we heard again in the previous talk, um, a lot of these really exciting opportunities that actually put together different healthcare data sets to be able to get new data insights and various things like that. I spent the last three years of my life as the chief commercial officer at Genomics England. And a huge part of that was actually taking the genomic data, linking it with clinical data to derive better patient insights. And again, this is unique to each and every individual, but it's also different in different countries. And we need to think about the way that the genomic data is collected. People need to consent to be able to allow that data to be aggregated with their clinical data to derive better insights. And again, this doesn't happen the same across the globe. We need to really and truly understand the motivations for these individuals. Again, going back to what I said at the beginning, when we think about individuals who are sick versus individuals who are healthy, a very different patient perspective comes through with that. So how do we start to think about taking some things that are on the periphery, not just your traditional healthcare data, uh, supplementing it with genomics and multiomics, and trying to, again, get a better comprehensive view of the individual? And then finally, that piece of aggregation. A lot of times this actually uh, either makes people feel very uh, secure based on the fact that putting a whole bunch of data together uh, uh, removes a little bit of the personalization. And that's really helpful to gather huge amounts of data for insights, but there has to be a mechanism to be able to make that identifiable in the sense that you would want, obviously, as much personalized treatment as possible. 
So there is a huge array of of things that are happening in this space to be able to think about connecting, linking, and aggregating. The bigger the database, uh, we often say the better, whereas I would actually disagree slightly. The bigger the database, the better it is if it's curated, if it's in a form that can be aggregated. There is absolutely no point in having two or three data points from one individual that are not going to be able to be aggregated with someone else. So how do we inform individuals about the fact that it's so important to be able to share as much as possible in a safe and secure way to allow those insights to be generated? So really, there's just, I think, three things that I covered today as key takeaways. I think, again, I, I'm, I always seem to be harping on the fact that in order for us to really achieve a truly patient-centric, uh, data-driven healthcare system, we do need to put the citizen at the heart of that. And it is so easy to say it, but actually in practice, it's not actually that difficult. It just never seems to be the thing that gets prioritized. But without having consent and without people being informed, we will have no data. So we really need to think about um, a really patient-centric way of collecting this data and having people engaged as well. Enriching studies, connecting health and genomics. This is a massive area that is uh, it's just expanding rapidly. There are more genomic programs that are spinning up around the world than there ever were. Uh, many of them are progressing quite rapidly. Uh, some of them were originally talking about single genes and then small panels. Many of them are now doing whole genomes to think about future-proofing the healthcare systems and also to be able to have a much more personalized approach. So keeping the patient in mind for all of this as well. The regional differences, going back to what we said previously, is a massive thing to think about as well. And then finally, all these new approaches, there's clearly going to be challenges for all of them as well. It's different in every country, as I mentioned. There's different regulations, there's different governance methods. How can we actually really bake in that support and also the confidence that this is being done for the right reasons. So I think, again, the last speaker highlighted a couple of amazing examples to show the benefit of actually really connecting these systems and really enriching the amount of data that's being collected from a variety of sources, mobile phones, um, your little card, your loyalty card for your supermarket. There's so many things that we can actually be collecting that allow us to actually have a much better um, healthcare system with our patients at the centre. So with that, I'll wrap things up. I just did want to point out that I've been part of the Personalized Healthcare Collective. This is an initiative that's actually run by Roche, uh, and they've got a, quite a lot of information on their website. Um, this is not a promotion. This is just to say that uh, it's been a lot of work that has been done in highlighting all the different countries around the world uh, and their maturity when it comes to personalized healthcare. So I will leave it at that and try to stop sharing my screen and come back to the main page. Thanks a lot. It was really interesting. So um, I have uh, a couple of questions. Um, how do you envision the role of regions uh, in the future of healthcare and personalized medicine in particular? Yeah, I think that's, again, it, it's such an important thing to remember that every country is different. Regions within a particular country are very different. And I think the most important thing is to actually place the citizen at the heart of all of these decisions. The more an individual feels in control or supported, the easier it is to actually work across a patch. And I think there are regional differences that actually supported. There's a lot of great things that can be learned in one area and transferred to another and there's other things that will just never work if you try to pick it up and lift and shift it so we need to be respectful of that and actually to enhance and highlight the great things that are happening in regional um, areas so and in concrete have you uh, examples on how to engage these uh, citizens to have them um, sharing their data yeah, so the example I'll use is actually the one from Genomics England. So in order to get individuals to consent to obviously do whole genome sequencing and to have their patient data, their clinical data um, aggregated with that as well, that was done established 
where sometimes the parents of children with rare diseases or the carer of someone potentially with cancer. And the governance mechanism is that all the data uh, that is being used, it's always being visualized by, the, uh, by, the, by the, the participants. They will always know what's happening with the data. They're involved in all of the access committees, the science advisory committees, the ethics advisory committee. They're, they're baked in as part of the system. And that was the only way that that program was ever going to be successful. It was really empowering the participant to be part of it. And so these data were um, used for clinical and research? Correct, uh, yes. Activities? Yeah. And um, are the, these data also available for the industry or? The yes. And again, the individuals who, who consented to be part of that, they're aware if, of the different uh, companies that are requesting access and the reason they're requesting it. So very transparent. The governance mechanisms are that they're part of it and therefore they understand that donating, digitally donating what they actually have had is making a difference. It may not make a difference to them, but again, the more data that's collected systematically across the patch, the better it is for people to make inferences. Yeah, and also uh, all the data from the apps and so on were also connected. Yes, yes. So, so, and not not in all cases. So that, and that was not a core component of the work that Genomics England was doing. That was for other individuals. So, if if that was something that was of interest to uh, a particular um, biopharma company or something like that, they could do that. But it wasn't it wasn't brought in as a core requirement. Mm -hmm. And all these data were. Um, collected and stored where at uh, Genomics England? Yes, yeah, so in a trusted research environment. And I think, again, that's another thing that we're seeing more and more happening now. Previously, a lot of data was available to be able to be downloaded. When we're talking about genomic data, it is huge. So it's actually not that easy to just hit the download all button environments have been created and are being created more and more now around the world. And the way that that works is that you have to have access to get into it. You're only allowed to see certain parts of the data and you're never allowed to take it out. So you do your analysis within the environment. And that, again, is a way to allow citizens to feel comfortable that their data is not being exploited or used in ways that they wouldn't approve. Mm -hmm. And um, did you have also some uh, citizens from more remote and sparsely uh, population, populated regions or Yes, and there was a lot of work done um, locally to be able to ensure that individuals understood the importance of having diversity. So if we just had a, a snapshot of individuals that all looked the same, that would really not be very helpful. The, the, the main important um, aspect of genomics is that we are an ethnically diverse uh, world and the more actually have of different um, citizens from different places around the world, the better it is. And getting them to understand that was a huge part. And because of that, it is a hugely ethnically diverse uh, data set, which is obviously an extremely important one to have. Yeah, for sure. And um, the, the use of the data, um, is it also in the consent that it's on, that it can only be used nationally or um, in case of research, some European projects could use it also. Yes, it's internationally. There are people all around the world using it. Oh, fine. Well, thanks a lot. Very interesting. So you could stay uh, till one to have some yes. question answered. Yes. Super. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, now I leave it to Jolene then. Thanks a lot.